Hi, Dean, can you hear me? Hi, Dean, can you hear me? Hey, all the rooms are busy. So if someone looks for me for contracts, I'm just gonna be in my office. Well, is there anybody in there? I'll just go in there. I have some, I have a couple people on the Zoom. So I'm just gonna go in here. Yeah, somebody wants to join me in here. Well, <laughs> it's okay. I don't know. It's, she's got a full room, so. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now, Dean. All right. I'm just going to listen to your presentation. That's what I plan to do. And and uh, I, I have, have a little bit of an understanding of some of the some of the uh, the changes, but just wanted to hear you know any additional ones you had. There's only one person here, so just okay, Dean. Hold on one second. I'm gonna get started in a minute. And if somebody's in there that wants to, just let them know I'm in here. And you can always connect to this. Okay. Oh, I can connect to this too. Um. All right, so just stand by, Dean. I'm I'm still connecting to the TVs. I'm waiting for some other folks to join. It's only 102, so. That's fine. That's as long as you need it, you're I'm fine. Perfect. Okay. So how do I join to this TV? So this way I know if I'm next time to you. Okay, so yeah, oh, we have, we have more coming on. Sweet. So let's do Apple TV. Okay. And then I should be able to do Apple TV too. This one's called Training Room though. Okay. I know, which is funny because I took it from the Training Room initially. That's what it's called. That. Okay. Training Room. Mm -hmm. And then punch in the code. This will be good because nine six seven six. Okay, just hold on, guys. I'm waiting for some others to get on. And I'm sharing my screen to another TV, so. Do y'all see my PowerPoint? And can you hear me?
Your voice can up on mine. I don't know if it's for you. Um, I don't know if they can hear me. Can you all hear me now? Let's see. Skeleton Still up on my microphone. Can you hear me? I, I Maybe I'll use the computer. Oh, can you hear me now, guys? It, it's going out. It's cutting in and out. Okay. My internet connection is not good because I keep cutting in and out. Maybe it's this room. Yeah, let's see if we can give it a moment to settle. I'm going to try something else. Let me take my earbuds out. The computer. Let's see if that's better. Can you hear me better now? Speaking up, Tom. Okay, built in microphone, built in output. Okay, so I should be on my computer, but I'm still breaking up. Let's see if we want a fan running in the back. Let's see. Let's see. I got several on here. Thanks for your patience, guys. We're trying to make sure we get all of our. How is that? Is that any better? Or might just move to another part of the building. I know in my office the internet's probably good. So, but will that change that any? So, click there. Sorry, guys, just hold on one more second. Um, just click on that, right? Screen so. here. Um, just. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go to the other part of the office. Sorry. <laughs> Try to get better internet connection. So hold on. Okay. Sounds pretty good while you're walking. Yeah, right? I, I think it was just that side of the building. I think I'm really good now. Okay. The big chandelier room doesn't have good wi-fi how's that is that better yeah okay that side of the building does not have good wi-fi <laughs> okay thank you all for your patience and let's go ahead and i think i can get started now okay all right let me shut my door Okay, yay. All right, so let's get started. There's six of you on here. So I'm also going to, I'm also recording this and I'm going to put the link onto our calendar um, under the UL links there. So that way, um, if you know somebody that wanted this and couldn't take it, they can listen to the recording. So the changes that we're going to discuss today are mandatory now. Um, they were created way back in the fall and April 1st, they became mandatory. So they've changed some of our major contracts, the one to four, but also importantly, they added addenda. And 
since they added addenda, we can't mix and match. So if you have something pended, something in escrow, you have to use the old addenda with it. Going forward, if you have anything new and you're using a new contract, then you use the new addenda. So we can't mix and match. Can't use a new contract with the old addenda and an old contract with the new addenda, okay? Um, they've updated our consumer notice and major changes on the one to four family. On the one to four family page one, they really paid great attention to what goes and what stays with the house. So paragraph B and C talk about improvements and accessories. And they really improved paragraph C, the accessories. What they wanted to really include and address was the lifestyle of 2021 and moving forward, right? With all of our smart homes and smart systems. This is really why it was created and they felt we needed some change. A lot of the controls that they put in the homes now are um, being controlled by systems and software, right? Alexa and you know the ring and all of those things. So we had a lot of issues with those staying and then they couldn't be controlled anymore or people ripping them out and then other services didn't work, right? So it became a mess, honestly. So we want you to pay really close attention to paragraph C and what they added here is what's in blue and it's security systems that are not fixtures and controls. Controls include sellers transfer transferable rights to the software and applications used to access and control these improvements or accessories and the hardware solely to control these improvements or accessories. So if they've installed this fancy dancy software system to make their home smart, guess what, they gotta leave it. And they gotta leave the controls for that. So if you know, if it only can be controlled by an iPad, well, you can't take your iPad and then there's no way for the consumer to control anything, right? So everything needs to be left. So that's just, just an example. Um, what I'm suggesting that you do with the, with the buyer or seller is really do a deep dive into what these systems are and how they work and make sure you and the other co-op agent are on the same page as to how they work, what are they, you know, how do we either leave this for the seller and the rest of the systems are intact for the buyer or how do we leave it for the buyer that they still stay intact that the buyer can use it for the purpose it was intended to be used for, right? The next biggest change on the same page is we added paragraph for leases. So these are going to be three different types of leases. And they're going to be a residential lease, fixture lease, and lease of natural resources. And this is how it looks. So at the bottom of the page here. So let's talk about the first one residential lease. So let me go back. If the property has a residential lease, you're going to mark this box A. If the property has a residential lease. If the property has a fixture lease, you're going to mark this, this box and I'll explain what that is. Or if it has a lease of natural resources. Because now Trek wants us to disclose that there's leases on the property or there's not leases on the property. And if we do have a lease, how are we transferring all that information to the buyer properly, right? Does that make sense? So let's look at the first one. 
Addenda regarding residential lease. I think I have this um, separated. Okay. So if your buyer is buying a home that has a tenant in it and the tenant is going to stay, then you're gonna mark the box that the home has a residential lease. And now we attach this addenda. And this addenda is going to say that a residential lease means any lease on the property to a tenant and it includes any addenda, any amendments that came down the pike or any move in condition forms, which is nice. Now it includes everything, right? And then it says the seller may not execute any new residential lease or amend any residential lease without the buyer's written consent. Exiting residential leases will have the following status at closing. And we're gonna mark either A or B. An exiting residential lease would be what? A lease that's coming to its termination. That's why we have it on the, on the market for sale, right? We had a tenant in there for a year. The seller gave their 30 day notice and said, Mr. Tenant, I'm selling my home. So that's an exiting residential lease. And so Trek says, if we have this, we want to know what the status is. And so A, termination of residential lease. All residential leases must be terminated by closing. Seller shall deliver possession of the property in accordance with paragraph 10 with no tenant or other person in possession or having rights to occupy the property. So this means they're out, they're gonna be done. Or B, there's an assignment and assumption of the lease. The exiting residential lease shall be assigned by the seller and assumed by the buyer at closing. Delivery of residential lease, check one of these boxes. The buyer has received a copy of the residential lease. Buyer has not received a copy of the residential lease and sell, seller shall provide a copy of the residential lease within three days of the effective date. Buyer may terminate the contract within a certain amount of days after the date. The buyer receives the lease and the earnest money shall be refunded to the buyer. This just gives the buyer time to, like a seller's disclosure, look at the lease, look at the terms and decide, hey, I, I want to, you know, buy this property with this lease on it or say, oh heck, <laughs> you know, I don't like this cockamamie terms you all agreed to and I'm out, right? And so that allows them to have some due diligence and some time to look at it and um, make an informed decision as, hey, you know, we wanna move forward with this or we don't, right? So it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. It just really, I think, clears up any mucky waters that there might be when an investor is buying a property and there's these leases on there, right? Because um, honestly, that really was never kind of clear cut how all of that gets transferred. So I think it, it really cleared the air on that. At the very bottom of that page, it also has sort of like a a mini seller's disclosure about the leases, right? It sort of kind of lets the, you know, seller be put on notice, hey, you gotta let us know if there's something wrong. In other words, that the residential, we wanna make sure that the residential lease is in full force and effect, that the tenant isn't in default or a violation. Hey, you have to let us know if the tenant prepaid any rent. And that if, um, if the tenant is entitled to any offset against the rent, maybe they did some work for you and you told them, you promised them, hey, Joe, if you fix the bathroom toilet, which is $250, I'll take it off next month's rent. Anything kind of like that, you gotta let the buyer know, right? Also, if they're, um, we want the seller to let us know if there's any pending disputes or if there's any other kind of 
special agreement, anything on a cocktail napkin, any options that you promised, anything of that nature. Just like a seller's disclosure, if so, you're gonna write in here what it is so that everybody knows. And then the last paragraph four here says, seller will promptly notify the buyer if the seller learns that any statement in paragraph three becomes untrue. So just like a seller's disclosure, you gotta let us know if, you know, at the time you sign this, everything was okay. Hey, if an event occurs and something changes, you gotta let the buyer know. The next new addendum on there is addendum for regarding fixture leases. So did anybody have any questions before I move on to the next one? We're good to go? Okay. Fixture leases. This has to do with um, sort of oddities. These aren't gonna be things that you're gonna see regularly in every house. Um, solar panels, they already have, you know, put it in here, propane tanks, a water softener, security system. This is not like your standard ADT security system type thing. This is, you know, the lease, right? So it's this super duper high, high end security system that, you know, you have 10 cameras in the back, in the front, it's something very high end that was probably very, very expensive that you actually have a lease for. So, um, so if you have anything like that on the property, this agenda is going to be um, put in place to take care of that, right? Disclose what that is. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So does, all of this assume that these are permanent fixed items. Is that the interpretation of fixture? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Like solar panels, those are extremely expensive. You know, um, they're put into the home. Um, normally people do installment payments on these things or they lease them, believe it or not. They're not um, purchased outright. And so um, if you have things like this, what I would suggest, you know, if the seller just say you represent the buyer and the seller discloses something like this, I would definitely want to do a deeper dive and say, what happens at the end of the lease? Does this stuff get ripped out? Is there a buyout option? You know, is this, if it gets ripped out, is it going to be damaged to the home? So it kind of, it's a red flag for you representing the buyer that you really want to investigate what this is all about and what happens at the end of these leases, what happens to this equipment, what happens to the home. Also this paragraph in here allows to address the situation, are there payments going forward? And the buyer is going to be required to assume these payments now. And paragraph two, it says prior to closing, the seller will or will not remove the lease fixtures covered by the fixture leases that the buyer does not assume. So it addresses it right here. Seller will repair any damage to the property. So say, say it's solar panels and the seller says, yeah, I lease this. I got a good deal. It's $300 a month, you know, and um, this lease is for the next 10 years, but you can get out of it. You don't have to, you know, assume it. And the buyer says, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want solar panel stuff. I don't want that. So then you would mark here that you want the seller to remove that and repair the roof. So, so it kind of just puts things in the forefront of it has these things, how are we going to address them? What's it going to cost everybody, right? Um, because nobody wants to be left on the hook for those things. And like I said, I've had a million phone calls about the security system, like your normal ADT. It, it's 
really that's not what this was designed for. This was designed for something that's got to be carried forward. That ADT is a service. Just remember, right? That's that ties along with your cell service, your phone service, and that's something that could be shut off and anybody can use whatever service they want. So not the same thing really. And then delivery of those leases, just like in the residential lease, either the buyer received a copy or the buyer did not receive a copy and allows for a certain amount of time for that to be delivered, allows a certain amount of time for the buyer to review it and say, hey, I'm out, I terminate, I want my earnest money back. Also notice that this affects section 22 where we address all the agenda that goes along with our contract. So these two new items will be in there. This is just a closer look of those paragraphs. The next thing that changed and one of the most biggest changes that really influenced how you're going to do business is section five and 23. And that section five is your earnest money and termination option period. So now the termination, the earnest money and option fee are delivered to the same party. They both go to the title company. Before we had the option fee go to the seller and the earnest money to the title company. Now they both go to the title company. And I just want to do um, just a reminder in our one to four family, it references title agent. Everybody seems to think that should be a human being's name. And that's not what that means. Agent in our one to four family contract and all of our Trek contracts, the agent is the title office. So escrow agent would be tradition title, Stuart title, Texas American title, not Mary Jo. Texas American title. So just, just a caveat. Um, I see that all the time. Everybody's sticking a human being's name in there and it really is just the escrow company. And the reason being, just if you wanna know why that is, is because if you write in there, Mary Jo and Mary Jo gets fired and she's no longer with the company, that puts the title company in a bind at, because they have a directive in a contract that's this is supposed to be going to one particular person, technically, legally. So um, just, we don't put it in there. So let's keep going. So the um, earnest money, an option fee have to be delivered within three days after the effective date. And they are both to be delivered to your escrow agent, your title office. So problems that are arising, we are having, um, we were having clients not deliver the full amount so this tells you in here how that's going to be divided up. The amount of the check is going to be first applied to your option fee and the remainder of the check will go to your earnest money. So if you put into your contract, your earnest money is $2,000 and your option fee is $250, your total check should be 2250, correct? If your seller, if your buyer makes a mistake and just brings down $2,000, the title company is going to go ahead and apply 250 of that check to the option fee. So that leaves only 1800 for your, for your earnest deposit. So now we have a problem because now we have earnest money that is short, right? One good problem is, okay, it allowed us to start our option period, thank goodness. But if we decided to terminate and the buyer is um, due their earnest money back, there's not gonna be enough funds to do that, right? So if a mistake is made, you really need to really hone in the sense of urgency for your client to get the balance of the money down to the title office. 
because they will be in default. And guess what? If your buyer is in default, the seller can terminate the contract. And with this heated market and with multiple offers and the next buyer tapping their foot, waiting for the first buyer to default and get out of that, as you could see, this could lead to putting you and your client in a very, very bad situation. And so what happens is this sentence down here, time is of the essence comes into play. So literally, whoever gets to the title company first is the winner. If you want it to be a winner, you know, or lose situation, meaning if your client made a oopsie and sent the wrong amount of money down and now they are in default, and if the seller sends the termination in before the, the balance of the earnest money can go back to the title office, the contract is terminated. And the seller gets to keep that money? The seller gets to terminate you and go ahead and entertain the next buyer, which probably has a better offer. But so do they have to return the earnest money since they're in default? Yeah, the earnest money will, will be returned, but there's, you know, whatever is left in there will we'll go back to, to the buyer. Okay. So you just have to be really, really careful. Um, you know, you can't say, I'm sorry, you know, the dog ate my check or, you know, I had, you know, had a plane to catch or, you know, there's no, there's no, you know, no excuses. I always tell everybody, you know, back in the day when I started real estate, we couldn't even write a contract unless they literally came to the office with a checkbook and wrote us a check. We wouldn't even write an offer if we didn't have the checks in hand, right? So no, no check, no contract. And so with technology and the way things are, are done, you know, that sort of practice has gone by the wayside. But you guys really shouldn't be writing contracts unless that buyer is really ready, willing, and able with, with a check in hand to go. A lot of sellers now, because we're in the market that we're in, is requiring a copy of those checks. And this is why we want to make sure that people just aren't shotgunning offers and throwing anything into the wind when they're really not putting the money to back it up. If you write a contract and it gets executed, this will be a question for you all, <laughs> um, and no money gets delivered, do you have a contract? If, if, you, if everybody signs and you put an executed date, but no money gets delivered, are you in contract? I would say up until the um, beginning or the end of the option period, yes. So, yeah, so the state of Texas says that even though no earnest money was delivered, you have a binding contract. So we have a lot of buyers who will go ahead and execute and the next morning have remorse and say, well, I'm not gonna bring my money down. And because I'm not bringing any money down, I'm not in contract. And that is not the case, they are in default. And so if the seller wanted, they could sue them for performance, they can hire an attorney and they can take suit. So what you wanna tell your buyer is, I'm so sorry, I, I could see you're very remorseful. However, we did execute a binding contract for the state of Texas, and I still need you to go down and bring your earnest money and your option fee. And thank goodness we, we requested an option period because that gives you the unrestricted right to terminate, and we just need to do that correctly. And so they have to bring their money down. You have to, you have to you have to go through the routine and the process and then send the agent their termination and release of earnest money. But things have to be done properly. Because guess what? If the title company got this document, they have a legal binding document that tells them to open up an escrow. And now the seller is bounded by an open escrow. Is he allowed to sell his home? No, you've just locked him up in binding escrow. So I get that buyers have remorse and want to change their mind, 
but you have to educate them and say, I am, I'm so sorry for you, but we need to, we need to continue on and take care of business the right way, but we can terminate you. Does that make sense? I wanna talk about the three day delivery a little bit. So the termination option, I think I kind of explained that um, you guys, the option period remains the same. You know, you have a certain amount of days and five o'clock on that last day, right? So if you, um, so you execute the contract April 1st, your clock starts ticking April 2nd and depending on the amount of days you have in here, five days, seven days, 10 days, that's your option period and it ends five o'clock on that day. This is the only contingency in the contract that has a, a timestamp of five o'clock. All other, all other terms are by midnight. So I kind of want to review the days with you. If you, have, if you sign your contract on a Sunday, that's your effective date, you have three days to get your money. If on the third day it falls on a Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, or holiday, it falls to the next day. So I wanna review with you some scenarios to make sure you understand how it works. If you signed a contract on Sunday, that's your effective date, then day one is Monday, day two is Tuesday, day three is Wednesday. You need your earnest money delivered by the end of the day. Common sense. You're delivering your earnest money to a title office. Is the title office going to be opened at midnight? <laughs> no. So you need to educate your client that please, you need to get it there by five o'clock or whenever the title office closes. Maybe your title office is in some rural area and they close at three in the day. So you need to make sure that everybody's on the same page and can get it there timely. In this next scenario, you, your effective date is a Wednesday. Day one is Thursday, day two is Friday, and day three falls on Saturday. Well, since it's a Saturday, it moves to the next day. Well, that's a Sunday. So it moves to the next day, which is Monday. Oh, but Monday's a legal holiday. So then the next day that it's due will be Tuesday. And in the last scenario, your effective date is a Thursday. Day one is Friday, a legal holiday. Day two is not a legal holiday, but that still will count as day two. Day three falls on a Sunday, so then day three will be Monday. It's all determined by the third day, not the first and second day, but by the third day. Um, po title policy survey and commitment. Let's see. I don't think um, I have anything on there. You'll understand this survey. Uh, title notices. Um, I don't think there's really there was I don't have anything really to discuss on there. There's no changes on on page three. This is your survey objections and title notices. Does anybody have questions for me on those th those paragraphs? Nothing changed. They're the same. Okay, and there's no changes on page four. Okay. On page five, we have a new section eight. This is the disclosure of the agent relationship. This was formerly on section four of the brokerage near the brokerage fees. They've moved this over. And so this just um, kind of elaborates a little bit more on disclosing that type of relationship that there is. And so this just states that um, Texas law requires a real estate broker or sales agent, that would be you, who is a party to a transaction or acting on behalf of your spouse acting on behalf of your parent or a child or a business entity 
in which the broker or you, the sales agent, owns more than 10%, or a trust for which the broker or sales agent acts as a trustee, for which the broker or the sales agent, agent, spouse, parent, or child is a beneficiary. So if you're representing a family beneficiary that you're a part of, that kind of thing, right? Then you have to notify the other party in writing before entering into the contract of sale. So in other words, if you're some sort of party to the transaction or an estate and you're gonna get 10% more, um, then you need to disclose all that. Um, broker's fees, all obligations of the parties for payment of broker fees are contained in a separate written agreement. I can't tell you how many times people are, are, are getting phone calls lately that um, agents are rebating their commission to clients. So I've had to say no three times in just the last 24 hours. Everybody needs to remember that the brokerage fees, the commission fees are a se separate written agreement. And that's per your Trek licensure. We can't make them part of the contract. And I, I, it blows my mind how everybody is just, I mean, that's, it's made that way so we don't fall into the trap of kickback. We don't fall into the trap of fair housing issues. We don't fall into the trap of bribing your offer based on how somebody's going to get paid. So, Here's just a real estate 101, right? How are the commissions structured? They are agreed upon between the seller and the brokerage, right? We have listing agreements. They cannot be part of a contract purchase. That's a separate agreement between the broker and the seller. So if you guys want to rebate your commissions back to your client, that's that's a decision you make and you handle that with your broker um, with your closing disclosure. So in other words, when you go to close, the broker has to write a letter to the title company and says, we agree to allow, you know, Peggy Sue to give her paycheck to her client and this is how it gets dispersed. So when you get your closing disclosure disbursement, instead of us telling the title company, cut a check to you, we're gonna tell the title company, you know, cut a check for $1,000 to her, $2,000 to us, and $5,000 to the buyer. And that's how that gets handled. We cannot um, discuss any of that inside of a contract. That's not what these changes were about, but I wanted to take the time um, because it's something that's literally coming up several times during the day. Brokerage fees or obligations are, are contained in separate written agreements. You cannot make them part of this agreement, period. Over here, 8B, this, so this is where it looks, this is what it looks like in the contract. It's gonna be on page five and they're gonna be right below each other. Eight, a talks about disclosing if you're part of the contract and B just letting you know that brokerage fees are a separate written agreement. Um, let's see, uh, this talks about possession. So um, this talks about um, smart devices, this has been added to this possession and closing section. This is new. So let's see, I think I have it. Um, okay. So smart devices means a device that connects to the internet to enable remote use, monitoring and management of the property. All items identified in a non-realty items agenda, items in a fixture lease assigned to the buyer at the time the seller delivers possession of the property, the buyer shall to delivers possession to the buyer, the seller shall 
delivered to buyer written information containing those access codes, the usernames, the passwords, and the applications that the buyer will need to access to operate, manage, and control all of those smart devices. The seller is to terminate, remove all access and connections to these improvements and accessories from the seller's personal devices. So in other words, the paragraph is making sure Mr. Seller, we don't want you all of a sudden being a voyeur and accessing, accessing our Alexa if you choose to use Alexa because it's powering everything and then all of a sudden you have access to it. So the seller needs to terminate all of his access to everything and make sure the buyer is given proper access by those usernames, passwords, and passcodes. So here is a tool for you guys, a tidbit, a nugget when to assist your clients, whether it's a seller or a buyer. If you are a listing agent, you want to advise the seller to set up a new account, set up a new password and email account um, to transfer all of these um, smart devices to um, typically it should be like the Smith family at gmail.com or change it to the house address mockingbird lane at gmail and then they can transfer all of those systems and everything to that one email and that email can be transferred to the buyer so it's just being aware now this is 2021 this is how systems and services of the house work we have smart garage doors we have the schlag um smart uh door openers now right we have ring we have alarm systems we have smart ovens smart microwaves so all of that now are smart devices controlled by an app and controlled by a smartphone and your smartphone is going to be registering those via an email and a password. So all that needs to be transferred to the buyer. So just be aware, talk to the listing agent, be a partner with them on how to get all of this stuff transferred. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, and then, um, so buyer's possession, um, this is just, uh, again, here's your smart devices is now put into there. Um, if you, all of our uh, possessions should be upon closing and funding, but you know, we have the option according to a temporary lease. And then underneath is, is the new paragraph smart devices. Um, nothing else changes there. Okay. On page seven, a change on page seven is refers to our paragraph 18, our escrow. And this just puts a caveat in, in there to state that when the title company receives both your earnest money and option fee, they get to determine what's good funds and what's acceptable to them. So in other words, um, they're going to determine on how the money gets to them via an app. Most don't take personal checks anymore, it's certified check. And so your client needs to adhere to getting them the proper funds. Does that make sense? They can't show up with a goat. They can't show up with a personal check or something from out of the country. It needs to be US regular funds that the title company can turn into cash right away. And they're gonna um, deem what's good or not. Also in this paragraph, it addresses expenses. So in the event that your deal busts out a couple of weeks prior to uh, closing and the title company has ordered a survey, they've spent the money on that and the buyer can't get the loan or the seller defaults, any one of those uh, scenarios, the title company can take um, from the earnest money and the money that they have any expenses that have been spent. And they're gonna go ahead and pull that out of those earnest monies and collect their funds. The 
The next paragraph is paragraph 21 that has changes in it. In this paragraph, they put two emails in here. There used to be only one. We have two emails in there because each party needs to um, disclose to the title office where notices need to go. And so there's an option in there for your email and the client's email. You always definitely wanna have your client's email and contact information in there. As a business practice, you can put yours in there. I would not solely put yours in there because that makes you solely responsible. So in this scenario, the title company sends you sensitive information that required an answer in 24 hours or it was gonna cost somebody money and you are out on a cruise or flying or dealing with children or grandchildren and you didn't see the notice, you are at fault. You've put your client at fault and you are responsible. So do not just solely put your name in there, put your, the name of your client in there. They are responsible. The title company is responsible to making notice and notification to everybody and they need to get proper notice out. So make sure your client's information is in there. Pat, section 22, they've just expanded that to add our new addenda, the addenda for residential lease, the addenda for fixture lease. And that's how they're going to look. Um, they've expanded a little bit the attorney contact information that's, that's now kind of moved under here. And what else? Determination option period, obviously that, that went away, right? Because that's now in uh, paragraph five of page one. So this is just showing you what it looks like now. And the last notice change that you'll see is on page 10. They have um, inserted here now team name. So in addition to all the other broker information that you're required to fill in, you also require now to get the team name filled in. The Texas Real Estate Commission did this because the consumer is owed the duty of knowing that there's a team and what this team name is in addition to the agent. And down here is where we typically put our commission and they've elaborated this to say, pursuant to a previous separate agreement such as MLS offer of compensation or other agreement between the brokers, the listing broker has agreed to pay the other broker blank this disclosure is for informational purposes, does not change the previous agreement between brokers to pay or share a commission. So what does that mean? On the MLS, it says that you're only gonna get paid 2%. If you write three in here, that doesn't mean you're gonna get paid three. You're gonna get paid whatever the listing agreement says you're gonna get paid and the suggested price will be in the MLS. But this always defaults to what the listing agreement says you're gonna be paid. So you can't write any old thing in here and say, I put it in the contract, because guess what? This is not part of the contract. And we can't make commissions part of the contract as I discussed earlier. And this is sort of the red line of what it looks like. And this is what it's going to look like um, in your contracts. This is your receipt page. The only thing they changed on here, this is not something you fill out. This is all for the title office. Page 11 is not for the realtor. This is for the title agent. And simply they put in their escrow agent. And just remember, like I said, escrow agent means the escrow office. And so the escrow office is now signing in your option fee. And uh, that's it, those are your receipts paged. 
So the other changes now, uh, that's it for our one to four family. I'm gonna move on to the other agenda that got changed. Any questions on the one to four family? Are we good to go to keep going? Okay. So let's keep moving along We'll move this along quickly. Okay, so our next agenda that changed is your HOA agenda. And so um, the HOA agenda has changed this fee section to add on to it and make it more detailed as to the total amount of different fees that can be charged and what the buyer may have to pay. This used to be just a very small sentence and usually just kind of addressed a transfer fee, 200 bucks. Now it says in here that um, all association fees, deposits, reserves, and other charges associated with the transfer of the property not to exceed a certain amount and seller shall pay any excess. So this uh, takes into account those capitalization fees, foundation fees, which could be two, three thousand dollars. So this is what this paragraph is now for. And then this paragraph still remains your title cert fee. So your job is to every single time you need to call the HOA and call the phone number that's going to be located here and make sure you are fully aware you can't take it for granted what's in the MLS. You need to call to find out exactly what all those fees are. Because a seller might not know what an HOA is now charging for a buyer to move into a community. When a buyer moves, say, into Cross Creek Ranch, there is a foundation fee or a capitalization fee that buyers have to pay. The seller might have bought his house seven, eight years ago. He don't remember what that is. He doesn't know. He just knows there's a, you know, I pay my HOA fee at the end of the year. So you need to call and make sure you're aware of what those fees may be. So paragraph C, very, very important. Verify, verify, verify. Notice of buyer's termination of contract. The, um, obviously, this had to change because the uh, unrestricted right to terminate paragraph changed. It used to be paragraph 23. It's now paragraph 5. So we had to change our, our termination right to address that. That's a simple one there. Uh, short sale addendum, again, that had to change because it had to reference um, paragraph 23. Now it references paragraph 5. And um, that's it. So that takes care of everything. Um, you guys have any questions? Look at that, 157. I got you out within an hour. <laughs> so have you guys come across anything um, in, your, in your travels and contracts that have given you any issues at all? No? OK. So, well, if you have any issues, um, come see me, give me a call and I will help you guys. I do have contract courses coming up where um, I go through uh, the one to four family and addenda and anything that you may need. So that way you guys will be really, really schooled and versed and educated on how to do all that stuff. So um, anyway, so it was nice to see you guys. Thanks for joining in. Was this helpful? <laughs> I hope so. All right, guys. Will you take care? It was good to see you. Make it a great week.